and welcome to Joy in Our Town. It is a delight to have you join us again this week for TBN's glimpse at what God is doing here in Central Florida to help people to be joyful about the good things that God is doing. You know, before I introduce my guests, aren't you glad that TBN is here and they're providing these kinds of programmings that are encouraging, they're addressing issues, and that's what joy in our town is about. It's just allowing you the opportunity to know what God is doing, how God is at work through people that God has chosen to use. And so it is my privilege today to welcome Tim Wisenen to uh, our program. Tim, welcome to Joy in Our Town. Thanks, George. You Good bring, to be here. Yeah, you bring joy because you are engaged with young people. And you're working with uh, an organization that you're the founder of, POP, P-O-P. What does P-O-P stand for? Uh, it stands for People of Purpose. And is that a ministry that is focused directly to young people, to teenagers? Yeah, it's focused on young people, middle school, high school, college, 20-somethings. We work with a lot of adults and parents as well, but our, our heart and our passion is uh, young people, middle school, high school, college kids. So do you actually go on the campuses or you do it through the local church? Uh, a little bit of both. Primarily, recently, we've been working a lot through the local church, uh, uh, coaching soccer, um, working with organizations to uh, impact their kids, kind of partnering with them to do those things we love to do. Yeah. Well, when you say the term teenager, I can tell you <laughs> that uh, bells and whistles go off, and, uh, and I am sure that there are a lot of people that are viewing today that are parents of teenagers or uh, emerging into that adolescence when they're coming into those teenage years. Uh, let's get right at it, Tim. Uh, you good. focus on a lot of issues, but probably there is no issue more significant in parents dealing with their teens than self-esteem. Why is self-esteem such an issue with teenagers today? It's a great question. You know, first, you know, you think about self-esteem, it's really kind of like a a cognitive thing. It's like a faulty thinking about themselves, the way they view themselves, their body, their abilities, and all that stuff. And and so it, it kind of perpetuates every area of their life. So it starts off thinking a little bit negative about themselves, and then it goes into other areas of their life, and it becomes just like just this downfall. You know, and psychologists say that the first stage for kids starting to become anxious or dealing with anxiety and depression is uh, negative self-talk. So these kids start viewing themselves negatively. It's kind of like their negative talk about themselves goes negative. And just little by little, it's like the lens they look at life through and the way they view everything in life gets permeated by that negative view of themselves. I have three grandkids. I almost say that on every program. I, I'll show you my camera, but I don't have time. Um, so in, in this negative talk thing, um, is true. I mean, I, we sit around the dinner table and we hear them and they'll, they'll make a negative comment. What would you encourage parents to do when they begin to hear negative talk? Because I think it comes early in life. It, they learn how to do the negative talk early. What would you encourage a parent to do when they hear so much negative talk coming from their teenagers? I think I would begin to ask questions. You know, if you look at the life of Christ, I believe in the New Testament, he asked about 135 questions to people. And the way to change someone's paradigm, the way they think, is really by asking questions. Who do people say that I am, right? And so I would ask your kids questions or grandkids, say, well, why do you feel that way? Or why do you think that about yourself? To kind of get to the heart of what they're believing, what lie they're believing, so you can kind of expose it and bring truth to it and be able to help change the way they see situations because their perception is reality, as we all know. Yeah, you know, that, that's a great uh, statement, Tim. Thank you for helping me with that because I think parents tend to feel more directive than they do inquisitive. Yeah. We think we can fix it by yeah. demanding, but yeah. we don't. We, we fix it when we ask the questions and we draw it out of them. Um, what are some of the underlying principles behind a teenager that is struggling with purpose. Uh, maybe let's back up. Purpose then comes out of self-esteem, right? So right. in this process, if, if, a, if a young person is going to, let's say, function better in the self-esteem, they've got to move toward purpose. What are some of the struggles that young people are having today with this whole concept of purpose? Well, I think it starts with identity. There's such a huge wave of culture going against identity. And you start looking how this this kind of pulls together. It's like, you know, 75% of, of teenage girls who uh, have a negative self-esteem will then engage into things like cutting, 
eating disorders, bullying, things like that. So it starts off by seeing themselves negatively, and it really goes down to the core of their identity. You know, everyone wants to lose weight. You got 44% of high school girls want to lose weight, 15% of boys want to lose weight. Then you got 40% of the high school boys who want to gain weight. You know, everyone wants to look buff. So you have this whole thing of self-esteem and identity that gets wrapped up. And uh, when they don't know who they are in Christ, everything falls apart. And I think some of the biggest things that I'm seeing is that you look at social media, for instance, okay? You got someone like a Kylie Jenner who's uh, on the Keeping Up With Kardashian show, 75 million Instagram followers. And you got someone like Kim Kardashian, over 83 million Instagram followers. And these kids are watching this and seeing this, and they look at this identity, and they go, man, I can't measure up to that. And so when they look at themselves in a negative way, and they don't have their identity in Christ, then they start to view themselves in a bad way to where they can't get out of it. And they start to feel like, man, I don't have any meaning. I don't have any purpose. And what am I good at? And I don't, my body doesn't look like this. And I watch these people with all their talents on TV. What are my talents? What am I supposed to do with my life? What's my purpose? So it becomes this vicious cycle to where if young people can't step into their identity in Christ, they'll never step into their purpose. So uh, again, we've got all these parents that are watching. How would you... Uh, help a student to address biblically the issue of identity in their life. So, if, so talk to me. I, I'm a teenager. Right. And, and, I, and, and so I come to you and I say, Tim, I want to understand how to find my identity. And my parents tell me that this book is the book that I need to use. How would you help me to understand that? Well, first I'll just kind of take you through some scriptures and kind of show you who God says you are. You can go back to Genesis 1, 27, talks about how you are made in the image of God. Yeah. And that God doesn't make any mistakes. Like, no matter what you think about yourself, what people say, God does not make any mistakes. And so take you through the scriptures and share that with you, as well as looking at Ephesians and showing you that you're in Christ, that the old has passed away and the old has made, or the, you know, old has passed away and all things became new. And to be able to show you what scripture says about you, to uncover what God says about your life. And what God says about us as human beings, that we are made in his image, that, and that when we understand that, it starts to change the way we behave. Because I always tell young people is that right believing leads to right behavior. We're always trying to change the teenager's behavior and say, you need to go have purpose. You need to figure out what to do with your life. But if they don't believe right about themselves, they can't go behave right, and they can't step into their purpose because they don't know their identity. So that's the idea. I walk you through some scriptures. Lay a foundation of who Christ says you are, not what people say, not what you believe about yourself, and then help you from there to be able to lay a foundation to build your, your, your spiritual house of purpose. Thank you. I, you put it just in a way that our viewers could understand. It, it isn't rocket science, folks. It does, though, take some patience. One of the things, yeah. though, that I think that we fail to understand, Tim, is the fact that a parent may say that once, but does it need to be reinforced? Over and over. That's where I think the relationship. You can't, you can't help a kid find purpose just by a one-time thing. It's consistent relationship that where you get to guide them and, and lead them down the path and help them figure out what to do with their life. So it's a consistent, ongoing battle. I know it was for me. It took me a long time for me to, <laughs> to get it. And that's why I started this nonprofit called People of Purpose, to help others find their purpose because I didn't know what mine was. Okay. And let's talk about you for So tell me about your life before you found purpose. What, what did you struggle with? Well, I grew up as a pastor's kid, and my parents got divorced when I was in high school. And, uh, and it sent me down a path of brokenness and being angry at God. And I started looking for purpose in all kinds of things. I tried all kinds of jobs, but I wasn't ready to embrace what God was really calling me to do. Why he put me on this earth? What was my purpose? Why did he breathe life into me? And I was caught up, and uh, I was gotten got caught up in pornography, and I was caught up in sex, and drinking, and partying, and girls, and uh, I love God, but I just had this woundedness in my heart that I could not break free from, because I wasn't really truly seeing my identity in Christ, and once I started understand who Christ made me to be, and then I started finding healing, and that's when I started to start to open my eyes up. It became not just information in my head, but it became revelation in my heart. The very thing my dad had been telling me my whole life Son, I've called, God's called to work with young people. And uh, as I opened my eyes up to that, was seeing how he made me, it just it started to click. Wow. First of all, thank you for being so vulnerable because that's not easy to say some of those things, yeah. when, especially on television. <laughs> Number two, I think that so often people 
uh, don't hear the real stories. But thirdly and most significantly, look what the Lord has done. Yes. He took a kid that had all these issues, and now yes. you're, you're a, you've got purpose and ministry and that in their lives, and, and you're sharing this kind of help and support. Okay, we've got, we've got again, parents that are viewing, and they're saying, okay, Tim, uh, I've got a kid that's really troubled. What do I do? What would I do in the next week that would help move my child into a place where I could communicate with them more about purpose and finding their purpose? What Help me to know what to do. Yeah, that's a great question. I would say that, number one, for parents or for you, just to start listening to your kids. It's amazing how when we just listen to our kids, how they start becoming more settled in their emotions. And to be able to ask them probing questions about, you know, what do you love? You know, what do you hate? Those are clues of the problems that maybe God's called you to solve. I hate seeing young people bound up in sin. God's called me to help solve that problem by speaking truth in the kids' lives and begin to help them find those things that they're naturally good at, that they're, they're bent towards. You know, the Bible says, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they grow old, they will not depart from it. Well, that word in the way is also in Hebrew is talking about their natural bent in life. Help them to find what they're good at. It's amazing how the self-esteem gets risen up when they find, wow, I'm really good at this. So in a practical way, you can help kids find purpose by just exploring and saying, what do you love to do? And what are your passions? And as a parent, you already kind of know that, but kind of help steer them to help them start having some wins about their life to build their self-esteem and then believe in them. Because one of the best things we can do as parents or mentors as pastors, community leaders, as look at a young kid and say, I believe in you. You can do this. I see God's greatness in you. And when you start to explore that and have time and conversation relationship, it's amazing how the DNA that God's placed in them just becomes to come alive. It's almost like, you know, the, the word of God's a seed. We don't have to say grow seed, grow when it's in the ground. You get that seed of purpose and identity in a young person. It's amazing how when you help nurture that through these questions and and steer them towards their passions, how they begin to come alive. So that would be something I'd really encourage them because give them a vision for their life. The Bible says, where well, there's no vision, people perish. But if we flip that coin the other side, it says, where there is a vision, people live. So if you want to get kids stopped going and doing this delinquent behavior that low self-esteem leads towards, give them a vision for their life, George, and watch how their life will start gravitating towards that vision. And it's a game changer. We've got to take a quick break, uh, Tim. And when we come back, I want to ask a question because I think that a lot of times parents don't do what they need to be doing because they didn't get a good nurturing side to their lives. Can we talk about that when we sure. come back and sort of helping parents to deal with their yeah, own absolutely. purpose as well? So you stay with us. We're going to take a 30-second break. Uh, we're going to come back and continue this discussion with Phil or Tim Wisenen as we talk about joy in our town because God wants joy in your life. Stay with us. They said I have troll teeth. That my voice sounded like a possessed baby doll. That no one would ever love someone as stupid as me. That I was fat. Ugly. Disgusting. The effect of bullying is potent. We will no longer be the silent majority. Now, when you see online bullying, there's something you can do about it. We're going to take action with the eye. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness, I am a witness and so are you. Welcome back to Joy in Our Town. I'm George Cope. It's been my privilege to be with you for a few minutes and to have Tim Wazen with us. Tim, thanks for joining us. You have been very insightful to us today. Uh, when we left, we said we were going to talk about uh, parents and this whole idea of purpose. Do you find that the reason why it's challenging for young people to find purpose is that maybe their parents did not understand it themselves and don't know how to nurture that in their life. Yeah, I think that that's definitely something that's, uh, that happens because, you know, things are modeled, things are more caught than taught. And I think uh, even for me, my dad knew what his purpose was, my mom did too, but I still struggled because I wasn't willing to embrace God's fullness of who he called me to be in my identity. So I think that definitely could be a, yeah. a factor. The ch we sort of assume that everybody in the church has the spiritual maturity and, uh, and growth factors about them. Uh, sadly, people think that because they've gone to church a long period of time that they're spiritually mature, and that's not true. Uh, as one old boy said that uh, a lot of people, they act more their shoe size than their real age. <laughs> but uh, in the process, 
we are struggling. I think identity is really a key thing, and the enemy, this book is all about identity, isn't it? Who I am in Christ, and, yeah. and I am righteousness, and I, my sins are forgiven, and that I, but I tend to go in and I beat myself up. So, uh, man, thank you for bringing that up, Tim, because it's such a necessary issue. The issue, uh, let, let's quickly, when, we, when a person doesn't have purpose and they have low self-esteem, they tend to fall into these areas of difficulties, and I'm sure what girls fall into is different from guys. Uh, this whole area of pornography for yeah. young boys. Um, can you talk a little bit about that issue of pornography in today's youth and what they're yeah. experiencing? Why is it that that is becoming such an epidemic, both in the church as well as in our culture? Yeah, it really is becoming an epidemic. There's not a week that goes by where I'm not talking and speaking with young people uh, about this topic. And it's amazing because I believe that it's such an epidemic because the devil knows how to attack us at the core of our identity. And this whole topic of pornography really goes and tries to erode our identity, tries to erode families and uh, marriages. And you look at what young people are going through. You know, the days, let's just be honest, the days if I wanted to look at porn when I was growing up, I'd have to go steal someone's magazine of my next door neighbor's dad, go hide in the woods and look at it. Now, the greatest battle yeah. you and I know is right here on this, this phone. It's cell phone. It's right here on this phone. And laying in bed at night, no matter where they're at, this thing right here, their third hand is always available. So this phone is, is the greatest battle. And, uh, and so you look at what young people are going through it. There's many reasons why they get caught up on it. But just for a second, George, I want to share with you. 66% of high school boys look at porn once a week. 16% of high school girls look at porn once a week. 58% of pastors in America are struggling with pornography. I don't know about you, but that's alarming to me. Absolutely. You know, and you, you think about the epidemic and, and how a lot of them, they'd say like half of teenagers will stumble across porn on a weekly basis, even by accident. So it's gone to be just this issue of we're purposely looking for. Now our youth are being bombarded from every angle with this issue of pornography. And I'll give you an example. Instagram is a huge social media thing, right? right? I'm on Instagram, and I went to my Instagram followers the other day. I'm like, who is this girl? Who's that girl? Webcam model, look at my profile. Webcam model. So I went and started deleting all these things, going, how do they even get in my Instagram? They start following, liking pictures. So a kid goes, they're just looking through social media, and boom, they tap on something, and Oh, what's that? And next thing you know, their eyes are hooked and they're scrolling through stuff. That's just one of many ways that the enemy is very clever in how to attack our young people. I, I want to take you back, though, Tim, because you made a comment that I think is important. You said uh, pornography comes as a result. It attacks our identity, that, 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 that self-esteem. What is it about pornography and self-esteem or identity that is so connected? Well, our identity is supposed to be in Christ. Okay. And at the core, pornography can become an idol. Okay. So, so it's God. So it becomes your God. Okay. And you think about how it is, like, you know, when they talk about, like, for uh, a guy, for instance, you know, people, you know, say that uh, it's some major emotional issue, and it really is. Here's what happens is a boy is fearful. Because of that fear, they hide it and they get angry, and the anger turns into eroticized rage which leads to this pornography addiction. And so the anger, the fear, this emotion for a guy or low self-esteem for a girl or whatever leads them to this state of being depressed or frustrated or stressed out. And all of a sudden when they go in and they look at this, this porn, which is against what God's word would say, you know, the Bible is clear on the issue of fornication or pornography and, you know, looking at sexually explicit images that are caused to create sexual arousal. And when they look at that, biologically, our brain starts to fire and kids become starting to get addicted to it. And so it becomes a major issue where that, they, they run to that for times of stress instead of running to Jesus. Uh, you know, folk, uh, I, this may be a very, very challenging kind of conversation. I'm sure that, yeah, you know, my, my family didn't talk and I'm old enough to, to know that way before the sexual revolution, but we've got to be honest, church. We, we can't bury our head in the sand and assume that somehow these issues are going to go away. We've got to address them, Tim. And I we do. thank God that you're out there and that you're working toward this. Okay. Because we don't, here's the one thing I want to say, George, about this, is that kids, 
right now, if you look at the more moral part of right. this, why we have to address it, one third of kids don't even believe it's morally wrong. Only, only one third of kids believe it's morally wrong. They, they, <laughs> recycling is on a higher priority morally than pornography. Wow. Which tells us where the state of the kids are at. Absolutely. So I, I guess the question that, that would lead me then to is what can we as a community or a church or parents do to help combat the issue? Because it's there, so give us some, some counsel, some wisdom yeah. on, as a parent, how would we deal with this with our kids, our grandkids, and these issues that we're dealing with? First and foremost, we've got to talk about it. It cannot be a taboo subject anymore. It can't be a taboo subject in the home. It cannot be a taboo subject in the church, in the community. We have to bring it out. But people don't want to talk about it because secretly... So many are struggling with it. But someone in each place, in each church, each home has to begin to make it not taboo and say, look, let's discuss this, the biblical model for sex and talk about pornography and what it does. So one thing is talk about it. The second thing is we have to educate ourselves on it. And I would encourage every person to wa watch this. There's a series out called The Conquer Series done by Dr. Ted Roberts. The best thing I've ever seen in my life on pornography. He talks about what happens biologically in the brain. And, and how this thing can become such an epidemic. And it talks about, for example, how what happens in the brain. You know, it's the limbic system, which is, imagine like the emotional side of the brain is the limbic system, right? right, right. The, the front, prefrontal cortex is more of like the CEO, the, the intellectual part. So here's the illustration is that, is, you know, the limbic system is like the gas pedal, right? Whoa. And the CEO, the, the prefrontal cortex is like the brake. But that brake doesn't get... Uh, established until kids are about 25 years of age, whereas the, the limbic system is programmed by age six, the way you deal with emotions, how you handle fear, process anger, all those things that are so key at a young age. So these kids grow up with all these emotional things, fatherlessness, stress, and now the gas is like, let's deal with it this way, and their, their, their brain is not able to stop it. And so we have to educate ourselves on what is happening and how this thing is really rewiring our brain. Every time we go to run to this issue, run to pornography, dopamine, the neurotransmitter, is dripping in our limbic system. It's bringing joy. This is called joy in our town. This dopamine brings joy, but it's artificial joy. And it locks in an image and it creates a neurological pathway. So as soon as someone gets stressed again, they run back to that thing for a shot of dopamine to bring joy when they're stressed or low self-esteem or they're angry or they're fearful or they feel lonely. And all of a sudden they start to attach to that image and it becomes literally an addiction. If you were to put up a brain scan of a normal brain, a cocaine addict, and then next to it, a pornography addict, the cocaine addict and pornography addict are almost identical on the brain scan, which shows biologically things are being rewired. So we got to educate ourselves on it and also talk about it. Okay. Uh, add addictions are powerful. A and I, again, we hold this book up. Can Jesus set people free? Absolutely. The Bible says, know the truth and the truth will set you free. So we have to be able to take people into the wounds of their life and help them access those lies they're believing and expose them with the truth of the word of God into their life. And the Bible says you'll be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We've got to help people expose the lies and expose them to the truth to renew their mind. And over time, this habit can be broken because we're a new creation. And through the word of God, the Bible says this. I love this. The Bible says in Hebrews that the word of God is active, alive, sharper than a two-edged sword. Well, neuroscientists thought the brain was static. It was stuck at a certain age until a decade or two ago. Now we know that body, the brain is active. That means it's always rewiring itself. It's, you get a new memory, you have an experience with God, you're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. All of a sudden your body, your brain's rewiring itself to that experience. So we bring the word of God, which is active. The Bible knew their brain was active before the community of brain scientists knew. So when we get the word of God, it brings a healing and renews their mind over time. And they say that it takes sometimes up to two to five years for a brain to be rewired, who, someone who is addicted to pornography. Wow. Well, it's clear you're passionate about this, Tim, and I, I want to thank you. You know what? Before we have to leave, I know that there are parents, and what I appreciate about TBN is that they are concerned about encouraging and supporting the, our viewers. I, I want you to look in, into the camera, and I want you to just take about a minute, and I want you to give some encouraging words to some moms and some dads that are struggling. They've got, 
they've got teenagers, they've got kids, maybe grandkids, broken their hearts. But would you encourage them for a moment, and then I want you to lead them in prayer. We've got about two minutes left. Would you just take a moment and look into that camera and just give them a word of encouragement so that we can end joy in our town, yeah. really in joy? I can do that. Well, parents and grandparents, I want to encourage you for a moment because I know we talked about some heavy things. And, uh, and I would encourage you, if you have a son or a daughter or a grandchild deal, dealing with pornography, that I would want to encourage you to get them in some help and get them into a Christian counselor and start processing the things that are going on in their life and get them in a small group where they can talk about real life and issues and get the Word of God exposed to those areas of their life because there is hope in the Word. There's hope in Christ. And if you have someone who's dealing with a lack of purpose or they keep making the same old mistakes over and over again and you're like, when are they going to get it? Let me tell you, for several years after college, I ran around doing these things I talked about earlier. And I know my dad was praying for me, my mom and people were praying for me. And, and I remember those times I was driving down Interstate 4 and I'd want to just run myself, my car into a telephone pole and just end it all because I didn't know what my purpose was. And I remember there was a time where over years of prayer that God got a hold of my life. And I said, Jesus, if you're real, I want you. He changed everything. He set me free. I haven't looked at pornography in over a decade or two. It's like God has totally changed me. So there's hope through the power of prayer and through relationship. Don't hold back on loving your kids unconditionally and just continue to lean into them. So I want to pray for you that you would just have open conversation and that the Holy Spirit would give you direction as you talk to them about these issues. So Lord, I pray right now for every person watching today. Lord, that you would just, just invade their, even their living room right now, that you would breathe your joy and your hope into them. Lord God, that you would help them be able to, to make a difference in their family and stand up for truth and be able to speak this truth in love, but be able to come alongside their, their young people and help them find their identity in Christ and find their purpose. Lord, that you would just make, just make yourself so real to these young people. Lord God, they have to experience the dynamic presence of you, Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would just break through every spirit of addiction and pornography and, and hopelessness and, and, and depression. And Lord, that you would just let people see themselves the way you see them. Lord, that they are your masterpiece. I thank you for that today, Jesus. We pray for your blessing upon each family today watching this program. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Tim, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today right here on Joy in Our Town. Please join us next week. We'll address another subject. Until then, bye for now. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network, Post Office Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711.